All right. Well, hi, Dad. Hey, I know you. <laughs> I am excited to be here today with you talking about doing business God's way and marketplace ministry and all the things connected to the jurisdiction of business and economics and how those those things affect not only that particular area, business, government, economics, but also our daily lives. So we're going to chat a bit today about business and all those things. And I think it would be kind of fun initially and interesting maybe for our audience to give a little bit of our business background, because not everyone is maybe familiar with that. And um, so if you could start us off a little bit, maybe tell me a bit about your business background. Go back as far as you can. Well, my first major venture in the business realm was uh, Dennis Peacock Mowing Services. <laughs> <laughs> I, mowed, I mowed lawns like lots of people do, lots of guys do. Um, it, the salary was tough. Uh, what I remember it was, it was a dollar an hour, wow. which was, you know, a lot of money. But an hour for me was mowing hand mowing. You know, it wasn't electric. There was no electric mowers. <laughs> okay. not, no, it was, you know, you're, you're the source of it. Wow. Which I enjoyed that. Uh, <clears throat> my family, uh, both mom and dad, had very good stewardship skills, ethics like that. Anybody that went through the Great Depression mm -hmm. and that went through the 20s and the 30s, uh, they learned to really care for the stuff they owned or were using or borrowing or whatever. So, uh, you know, the main uh, production skill set was uh, muscle. Mm -hmm. The technology was very high tech. Uh, it was an old, <laughs> an old lawnmower, you know, probably was 20 years old. And I, I probably didn't sharpen the blades as I should have because, but because I was only like eight or nine years old when I started that, the older folks in the home, especially the women, the grandmas, and what have, they would come out and bring me lemonade. Yeah. They, they, had, yeah. they had a very real desire to make sure that I didn't perish. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I was uh, the saver of money. Uh, my older brother, Frank, and another guy, next door neighbor named Jack, the three of us, three amigos, uh, they were three years older, but I was the one that saved money. Uh, so whenever anybody wanted to buy something, they would come and ask come me, do you, wanna, "Do you want to loan it or whatever?" But uh, you know, I enjoyed business right from the very beginning. I enjoyed practical results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then tell us a bit as you, I know one of your, your first real, not that that wasn't a real business, yeah, but maybe a, sure. a larger business that you were a part of uh, was. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> when I finished uh, Berkeley, dropped out of graduate studies, ran a pool hall, all the, a lot of the folks know, you know, where I was in an unsaved world uh, and struggling with uh, a lot of stuff in, in the 60s. Uh, in its own way, was at least as intense as what we're going through now. But we didn't, culturally, we didn't have the experience of what that was like. In other words, our parents' generations, they weren't rebelling about anything. They were trying to make sure they had food to eat. Mm -hmm. So it was a whole different trip. But uh, I, I ran the pool all for a while, and... Uh, then decided, you know, well, I I knew I wasn't going to run a pool all the rest of my life. Right. What, what am I going to do? And uh, I started looking for work. I had the skills, you know, background in, in economics and uh, took a job with uh, labor unions uh, and actually was doing economic research uh, for the two and a half years that I was there at the California Labor Federation. Uh, primarily getting the grape strike and unionizing uh, farm workers. I lobbied in Sacramento on behalf of union stuff. Uh, and then the last real, like, full year, uh, I was uh, uh, analyzing uh, from a public utilities rate regulation 
against Pac Bell and actually was uh, functioning with all the uh, attorneys, the attorneys of all the major cities in California and me, which I was the only one in there that didn't have a law degree, hmm. but didn't stop me from doing what I did. And actually I wrote a brief primarily at the end of that decision on uh, Pac Bell. And it was good enough that it was primarily used uh, to help the Public Utilities Commission determine what the rate would be. And uh, even though uh, I dropped out of doing that and started the flower business. That's what I was trying to get to. Yeah. You, became, you became a small business owner. I became so a, tell us about how you became a small business owner. Uh, well, an old friend of mine, you would remember Jack, was a florist who was a very, very good friend and did it very successfully uh, working with hoth hospitals on uh, on sale of flowers, fresh cut flowers. So he made, you know, he made it sound good enough that if you want to try this, even though you're not a florist, you know, we can teach you to do what you need to do, the basic stuff. So in May of 1968, uh, I dropped out of, or stopped working directly for the uh, labor unions, except they hired me uh, as an aside to again assess uh, the rate regulation for PG&E, the global or the uh, national and uh, California in energy. So the flower company, uh, boy, anybody that has, has done a small business can tell you, you are married to that business. Yes, yes. And especially because you, we were dealing with perishable items. Mm. You know, a lot, what, you, what we didn't sell went in the garbage can. And money down the drain. Exactly. So there was a lot of pressure on learning that. I actually really uh, came to enjoy, uh, be, you know, being a, a florist. Uh, and uh, I, I call it my uh, Ferdinand the Bull period of my life where, <laughs> the, you know, the athlete, uh, made way for, I just want to be with the flowers. <laughs> but, uh, and of course, your mom, Jan, uh, she had worked for her mom and dad mm -hmm. for years in high school. <clears throat> I was training athletically, uh, really in the summers. And I was, you know, the Olympics and all that stuff was what my main target was. But I loved uh, being in business, not just yeah. because I was independent, uh, but I, I know I, I love getting things done. Mm -hmm. I, there's a part of me that, you know, really, really enjoys uh, knowing what the project is and then doing it well. So it was uh, five years of uh, your mom and I slept in sleeping bags on the floor of, of your, that, of your of, business, of yep. the business, and we're glad to do it. Uh, yeah. The first, you know, six months was tough. We were hanging there on the ropes for a while, but then we uh, we did uh, get all the management uh, operatives in place and uh, secured uh, expanded. Oh, that I started that business from selling all the accounts, and um, so I know I knew every facet of that business. <clears throat> and then your mom did, uh, you know, the taxing, administration. the administration. Uh, but I loved it. And uh, and you guys sold it eventually, right? And we sold it after five years. Uh, I started a Bible study up here in Sonoma County. Mm -hmm. uh, and it grew and grew and grew. And, and we had ordered the workloads uh, so that I was working... Uh, I, I do 40 hours of labor in three days. And then uh, uh, initially I spent, I thought I might be going to be on the PGA golf tour, which again, I had no idea how good those guys were, <laughs> but I, I uh, <clears throat> would drive from here down to San Francisco, which is where the flower business shop was. And it was big. We had, the, we got, had, about 20 accounts and so many flowers. I mean, it, it was amazing. 
uh, how, how much production we did. And I would drive down there and spend three nights and uh, days down there working. And again, it gave me a chance to organize. I really enjoy getting stuff organized. And yeah. That. So, yeah, anybody want to talk about small business and what is it like to have a baby? Uh, yeah. Your business is your baby. And uh, I, uh, I got AIDS in accounting, which is not really part of my nature. You know, I'm more of a Mac. Uh, macro. Mac, mm -hmm. Macro, not minor. But I enjoyed the accounting and I enjoyed uh, especially unit pricing of knowing actually how much money was in everything that was in the products, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that was, you know, did that. We sold it, uh, should have got a lot more money for it th than we did. We could have. Uh, that was a real mistake. I didn't get enough advice from other people who uh, would have given me a better set of criteria as to what it was really worth. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we sold it, and that's what we lived on in terms of the ministry. To get the ministry Because nobody had any money. And right. <laughs> these are all hippies. So we're mostly trying to help them, you know, brush their teeth and know when to, you know, take showers. <laughs> <laughs> But, so that actually was a catalyst for you of provision, really, for uh, you getting into the ministry. I could uh, not have done the ministry if we hadn't done that business. Very interesting. Just no question about it. It's really interesting you think about just yeah. how God, sometimes the unlikely ways yeah. that the Lord provides for you to yeah. do yeah. certain well, things. So. Like my my academic information in, in the history of mac, mac, mac economics and the history of philosophy and political action political theory, which I, the construct of my study in that was largely from a, a leftist point of view. Yeah. But I could not do what I've done without that study because that was my foundational worldview. Right. And I had worldview from uh, particularly Sheldon Wolin, who is a renowned political expert, political theorist. And in the same way, I could not have done the quote-unquote apostolic part of what I've done of organizing groups and making stuff happen like that if I had not had that company. Yeah. So You can see, yeah, again, it's just wonderful to see the foundation and, and how God has used those different things to position you for, for what you're doing. Um, and we're going to come back to some of those ideas because I want to talk a little bit more just around some of the big ideas that are in the book, Doing Business God's Way, and things that we really talk about, you know, as a ministry on these things. Um, I was just going to share also a bit, just thinking around our business backgrounds, because you mentioned, you know, your parents being obviously wonderful stewards and both worked and shared a lot of different insights through that way. You know, I, I owe a lot to you also for my business background, mm -hmm. because my first business, uh, some people know if they visited our home <laughs> In the 80s yes. or maybe early 90s, early 90s, they would have seen my first business venture, which was a store called KJ's Collectibles. And uh, in our <laughs> household, often housed uh, people would come through for ministry events yep. and regularly we'd have decent sized gatherings at and the home. Would. People staying with us, people coming in for mi ministry events. And we had this little room uh, near our garage that they kind of half finished for me because I had this idea. I was an entrepreneur from a young age, you were. always was doing, actually, I remember second or third grade doing different business related ventures, trying to sell things. Yes. <laughs> when people would, we had a lot of leaders. I mean, yeah, major leaders. And you would be hitting them almost immediately to come downstairs in the KJ's collectible. Check out my store. Yeah. I was like, hey, these people are all coming to our house. I have a captive audience that I could sell things to. Right. So I, uh, you were my first landlord. He provided rent free. That's right. For me, my first storefront. And I would sell, uh, I had several gals in the, the church or in the apostolic community that would donate jewelry to me that they no longer war and so i had a jewelry collection i would go to costco and purchase candy and okay. bulk and then you know up upsell it you know price it up so i had a i had a business then i also uh, published a magazine at one point uh out of the small christian school that i went to and it sold so it to funny. different friends so i was always very uh entrepreneurially minded and business minded 
And um, well, you were hard to say no. <laughs> you were really hard to say no to. I was trying, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to provide things that they, I think they did need them. I wasn't trying to just sell them things they didn't need. Exactly. You know, but uh, but it's funny because I do remember definitely um, always a sense of an entrepreneurial spirit actually yeah. in our home, yeah, yeah, and yeah. that those are a good thing. And stewardship. And, and stewardship, yes, which I want to talk about. Uh, and for me, you know, I I have worked with you in the ministry for years. Um, in fact, I, I joke with people about if we. If we don't include uh, the the major violations of child labor law that were going on, uh, because I, from a young age, was forced to do mailings, you were, <laughs> among you other were. things. Uh, but eventually, I came officially on staff and worked with you. But uh, for those who don't know, alongside working uh, with my father and my brother at the time in the ministry, I had a, a side business uh, because I'm a dancer and, and training of teaching uh, dancer by training teaching dance because right. I love dance and I love children. Right. And the Lord breathed on that where I ended up actually getting my own dance studio yeah. and managing a dance studio for 20 years. I just sold it about a year and a half ago uh, when I shifted positions here at the ministry. But that for me, like you were saying, I mean, having a small business, there's nothing like it for what, like you said, it's your baby and you're everything. You know, yeah. I was marketing. I was, well, my husband, my husband and I together, my husband was the handyman, the plumber, right. the security team, right. all that. I'm marketing. I'm, you know, management, I'm HR. And it's, it's so much, but you learn so much. And it's a wonderful way, obviously, to interact with people. And I know for both of us being in, in the ministry, quote unquote, having had also experienced more in the secular world of business has been really a benefit because that's where most people are spending their lives. And it is right. a ministry, which we're going to talk about. It is a ministry. Everything is ministry if we're doing it as under the Lord. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting we talk about the business because I have that whole business side too that uh, I, I love talking with you about some of those things because there's some fun you're, camaraderie you're, there. You're much more gifted in administration than I am. But you are, a lot of our similar similarities would be the demand to organize yes. <laughs> and recruit yes, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and sell. Yeah. Really... yeah. Well, okay. So that's a little bit of our foundation and some of the business side right. on top of obviously being in a, a ministry, a nonprofit ministry for now we're at 45 years founded in 1979. And I've been working with you, uh, like I said, offic uh, uh, officially not under the table, uh, for almost 25 years, yeah, which is crazy when you think about it. And <laughs> because of the background in ministry and people would find out that I had a small company and, and I had a background in cost accounting and that kind of stuff, <clears throat> I would, I always had a number of people who were privately coming to me with business issues, mm -hmm. not to go into business with them, but advice. Yeah. And I loved it. One of the things that was a challenge to me I easily uh, vocationally could have loved being a, a mm -hmm. business uh, consultant. Mm -hmm. And I, the Lord did allow me to do one significant size insurance company and help, help them for three or four years and did well. But uh, the Lord didn't want me to, he wanted me to do what I do in doing business God's way as an instructor, yeah. but not to actually get the chance to, to do it myself. But I love business. Yeah. It's wonderful. So talk to me about, let's talk about doing business God's way, because when you wrote that culturally at the time, there was still very much an attitude of dualism of, yeah. you know, you're not, it, your work is great, but you're maybe a cash cow. The best yeah. you can do is make as much as you can to donate it to the church so people can do their real ministry. Yeah, the real and it was a whole ministry. dualistic approach to ministry, which I don't think we have as much now, but at the time, it, you were really a bit of a voice in the wilderness. So yeah. talk a bit about why you wrote Doing Business God's Way and some of what the climate was like at that time. Well, between micro and macroeconomics, I mean, I loved business, but I also loved the realities of managing economies and what was involved in that. Um, yeah, I, I laugh and say many of our early, early meetings could have been held in a phone booth. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was, you know, honestly, without being a hero, I was one of the very early, early pioneers relative to the validity of ministry in business. And uh, uh, 
started in 1980 to really focus on that. We were working on uh, gathering folks and actually starting a business venture in the ministries, which we ended up doing, and it ended up going broke because we, <laughs> I never had this lesson until that one, is our sales department outran our production ability. Mm. So we mm -hmm. oversold what we couldn't deliver. Mm -hmm. And eventually, I mean, we made, we, we uh, grew from, I remember the first year of that business, which had, oh, we ended up having a, almost 100 people from the various ministries that we are connected with. I think the, the first year uh, we did like $90,000. Second year we did 280000 and the third year we were pushing a million. And this is in the early 80s. In the early 80s. Yeah. And again, we swamped the boat with our ability to sell, but what we couldn't produce. And it was very painful. We lost money. Tough lesson. But again, I learned a lot of lessons in that situation. And again, uh, probably the biggest one was to make sure that I don't didn't oversell what I couldn't produce mm -hmm. uh, in terms of activities, products, mm -hmm. uh, whatever. Point being, uh, you know, on one level, everything is business. Everything right. is stewardship. Right. Everything is management. Everything is assessment of where people are at and skill sets and not bridge of trust, you know, knowing, you know, and that's where a lot of that, the, material for doing business God's way came out of, again, my life experiences, not just academically, uh, but in terms of uh, victories and defeats in projects, et cetera, et cetera. We would be very, very similar is <laughs> uh, you came into the, my study here and I'm managing a new set of projects that I've started mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you're, you're well on your way to doing the same thing. You're more administrative, so you're a little safer than I am doing that. But yeah, we, we love to start things and love to organize and love to get people yeah. in roles and positions of what you know what they could be. And I always have as my nature, the way God made me, is I tend to see people in potential and what they can do. And that got me in a lot of trouble in the beginning because yeah. I put people in roles of authority based on what they could do, uh, but not based on what they're currently doing. Right. And again, or that they could that they could manage. You know, yeah. you talk about with the bridge of trust yeah. and character that you see a lot of potential and you see wonderful giftings, but if there's not the foundational character and certain skill sets underneath, it's not. Yeah. yeah. And the business world is real. I mean, as an athlete, I knew exactly what my, how far I could jump and how high I could jump mm -hmm. and everything was scalable and measurable. Uh, I do, we call that results-based you know, reality. Results-based reality. Again, <laughs> learned the hard way. Yeah. So. yeah. so you put those experiences into doing business God's way. And also I would say, because you were running in the church world, you were seeing firsthand also some of the disconnect there oh, of how people were being treated or just missing. Not not necessarily that the church is trying to be malicious, but that there was a lack of maybe understanding or awareness of some of you know the reality of that we are all in business yeah. on a certain level, and that all voc vacation. Talk a bit about as work as worship. I'm thinking about that concept. Yeah. <clears throat> well, yes, work is worship, and work. Divine labor is doing what God made you to do. And I had a whole intellectual background on that uh, based on Marx and his critique of capitalism mm -hmm. of people being widgets uh, and alienated labor, which is a very powerful concept of using people and how capitalism is guilty of using mm -hmm. people. Obviously, in Ephesians uh, 2.10, uh, which essentially says, look, God gave us tools, gave us a calling that uh, because God pays for what he orders. We're going to talk about that. Yeah, whatever it is that God wants to do, he's going to make sure you, that you have the resource to do it if you're careful. So again, uh, that was a lot of that experience was 
giving advice, watching people take it or not take it, seeing the consequences of what happens if you didn't take the advice, uh, learning how to really appreciate experts. Mm. Uh, again, you know, I've had the privilege and the challenge of it relating to thousands of people, you know, in 50 years and running around the world. Um, so I'm, you know, and to me, every day is training day. So I'm learning and, and observing the fruit of people who practice these principles and what that produced as contrasted with people who are doing other stuff. And again, my teaching dimension, my teaching heart of wanting to see people empowered was has been watching with a lot of pain of people who couldn't listen or wouldn't listen. And uh, okay, and here's me as a teacher and instructor. What's the core issue that they missed? What's the core principle that they missed? And, you know, hundreds of people are the really the fruit uh, my ministry, the fruit came from watching what they did and what happened. Mm. Again, the other thing I should say, I was offended, and it, there still is a degree of offense. When I saw that the, a lot of the, the pastoral dimension in ministry didn't respect what was going on in the business world. Mm. And, you know, I, I've seen many situations where pastors who maybe could pastor 80 people or had a church of 100 people, the decision-making level was way below some of the business leaders that I knew that were dealing with millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And I would watch these pastors, bless their, their bless them in any event, you know, having no understanding of the difference between the scale and what you deal with in the business world, a lot mm -hmm. of people, and what pastors, the pastors are terrible, a lot of work. I mean, I love pastors and what they do. But the whole issue had, you know, created a, a gulf. And I was aware of that from the early 1980s when I started really going after uh, building the educational system around economic stuff and business, which came to the business school and other things related in terms of pu public policy ideas. Uh, uh, I, I tried to, to make sure that I was able to to penetrate the, the church leaders and l help them view the way they related to the business community that was really offensive, which was, you know, if God, they didn't say this, but it was implied. Mm -hmm. If God really loved you and endowed you with his work, you'd be a, you'd be a pastor you'd be a pastor not recognizing yeah. that they're actually discipling in and the marketplace were, and pastoring people pastoring the with CEOs are yes. pastoring uh the equivalency of all the the apostles and the prophets in that dimension in that jurisdiction you know those offices in the church exist totally in the world they're prototypes of personalities with gifts mm -hmm. that are apostolic and prophetic and evangelistic. I mean, the salesmen are evangelists. Right. So I again, I right. tried to help everybody get a shift in perspective. That yeah, way. trying to yeah. help them see that you know, on one, you've heard me say this a thousand times. It's all one thing. Yes. If you really see what's going on, you watch the way the Holy Spirit is dealing with us in everything that we're doing in life. Right. So, and the business leaders have access to the people, quite frankly, mo more often don't. than the pastors have. Yeah, absolutely. Because they're 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 the bosses, they're yeah. the co-workers, they're yeah. they're in the field yeah. with them. And so what better place to we have a whole teacher on the marketplace discipleship. I mean, what better place to be salt and light yeah. and to influence and to guide and and to be seen. You know, I yeah. <laughs> Way back when, I realized, look, in my role in the church, I see people on Sunday, and I may see some people during the week. The employer sees them 40 hours a week. Right. If you really want to know where somebody's at, don't look at them on Sunday. Look Talk at to them their on boss. Monday <laughs> and Tuesday and Wednesday yeah. and so on yeah. and so forth. Yeah. So I, lo I love that dimension of Rian, and we have made some progress. Yes. I mean, yeah. there's so much more now. I know from just, you know, what we do at the ministry, seeing more and more groups 
pop up and right. get connected and understanding that, which is so important because uh, yeah. otherwise it's another vacuum in the culture that we've abandoned yeah. <laughs> as believers. Exactly. So it's really important. Um, let's talk about a couple of the big ideas uh, around marketplace ministry. And I know you talk about these in the book. You mentioned earlier, well, there's a couple I want to go after. Let's talk about stewardship because the mm -hmm. first the first point, there's there's 12 master principles. You like principles. We have we have so many principles. Anyone who's connected to our organization knows we've got we've got the 12 principles in doing business God's way. Then we have the 12 master principles, which are around public policy and building. And then we have 39 principles of, of transformation. transformation. So right. you know, if you need principles, we're your we're your people. Yep. Um so, but in the book, you go after some of the principles. Um in uh that connect to, to ministry so in this book you have 12 principles that you also address to kind of break up the chapters and the first right. one starts with god is the creator of private property and you go into issues like stewardship why is that the starting point of of the book and of why is that so important satan's accusation uh about of dealing with discrepancies and of inequalities, uh, of of gifts, uh, but particularly economic inequalities. Uh, I lost where I was going. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. His his attack against private property is the centering point of Marxist theology. Yeah. The centering point is all private property is theft. Right. Now that's a huge thing to say. And again, the political part of me, uh, the principle-based management of cultures and economic global economics, if pro owning property is a sin, then God is the biggest center Jesus. of the universe because mm -hmm. he owns everything. But one of my frustrations and still you know, 52 years later, at least, I'm still saying, why didn't anybody ever produce any powerful refutations of the idea that private property was sinful, that anybody that owned stuff, a lot more we could talk, not in this discussion, maybe later. But that being a core of my understanding, uh, all it did is make me more interested in stewardship and managing responsibly what God has given you to care for. I, you know, I, I began to teach in Central America. I've been down there a bunch over the years. If you want a nice car, take care of your bicycle. Right. And, you know, I, before I started the school or before we started the school, it was a summation of at least a dozen years of teaching on business stuff around the mm -hmm. world. And then we finally began to see the patterns and the principles and pull it all together. Business school was 1996. But as I was uh, running around primarily the United States, although I was working out there, but mostly in the United States, I was going into the cities trying to get city action councils formed as you know, community involvement yeah. through leadership locally. And whatever city I would go into, and I, you know, when I was that young, I'd do three cities in a week. I always did uh, a good two or three hours with business leaders, dealing with, again, basic ideas like if you want to get it, well, it's out of Luke 16, Luke 16 uh, faithful and small, faithful, faithful and large, yeah. faithful when somebody else's stuff faithful in your own. And that's a stewardship idea. Absolutely. So it's, and, and why is stewardship so important? I think I know the answer, but I, I mean, I, yeah. because, you know, why does God, because I know you talk about this further, yeah. what's so important about stewardship for us as human beings? Because God wants us to value what he has created, mm -hmm. you know, as an ultimate concept, uh, thine is the power, you know, in the Lord's Prayer, he makes the point in the beginning of the end, you know, for thine is the kingdom. It begins with all of this belongs to you. Mm -hmm. And it ends with all power is yours as well. Mm -hmm. In our fragili fragility, and I use that word advisedly, we are, are fragile in many ways. 
he certainly outside of court were very fragile, really fragile. But power has got the ability to really show where somebody is at. Mm -hmm. You don't know where somebody is until their perceived day of power. Mm -hmm. uh, again, like Paul said, don't lay hands on nobody quickly. Let's, you know, because that power, if the character is not there to undergird it, is going to destroy people. Right. So the whole issue of stewardship is not just about honoring what God has made, but it has got the safety factor as well, is God will God will never, he will permit it, but it's not his perfect will, to see somebody get loaded with power that they can't carry. Right. And stewardship deals with all of that stuff. Yeah. And it connects to, you talk about another phrase you use a lot is, we grow up caring for people and things. things yeah. So the Lord uses, in our stewardship, it also produces maturity yeah. and and empathy and awareness and, and yeah. management skills, all those things, right? And, they all and the use of power. And pa yeah. God, God has got a lot of faith in humanity. You know, yeah. I sometimes say, God, nobody's got the faith you do <laughs> because you're you willing in Christ to put your whole trip, everything you've done, you are wanting to share that and teach us to manage it with you. You know, heaven, yeah. eternity is not the way it's, you know, been described, but eternity is the maturation and the ability to increasingly take more responsibility as we're working together with God. Right. He's, he's pulling us into the family business. Yes, which is a big theme yeah. in the book. And we talk about, I know, in school yeah. too, but that we're, he wants us to co-manage yes. with him. It's yep. that it's that both and it's the working together. It's giving God something to work with. Yes. We have to do it, obviously, through his power and in his way. But he wants to work with us. It's, right. he, he's not trying to have us run like robots, just doing it's That's why we have free will, right? Yeah. I mean, it's meant to be something we can engage and and choose to be with him. And it's exciting. I know when people realize, oh my goodness, I, when you get saved, it's not just you got saved to go to heaven. You got, you got uh, brought into the family business, yep. like you're saying. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And of course the family business as a family endeavor is really, if we're talking about a biblical foundation of culture, uh, there's going to be a lot of private ownership and there's going to be a lot of training and responsibility. Why? Uh, makes it so critical right now in this clash between centralization and localism. Localism is the safety net that God uses to keep people calibrated at, as to how much power they really can handle without having it damage you. Mm. And the problem with centralization uh, is it, it takes responsibility away from people when God wants to give responsibility to people because caring for people and things is what grows us up spiritually. Right. So when you get into a whole, a whole lot of ton of political things, we could say right there. But uh, managing the material world is what separates the boys from the men and the girls from the women. Uh, because you come to a certain point of responsibility where it begins to connect you with God and it makes you see things from the way you see things as responsibility increases in what you're doing. So yeah. we try, you know, business is all about empowering people in, in uh, situations. Right. You earlier we were mentioning the phrase "God pays for what He orders." Right. I'd love to chat a bit about that because I know <laughs> in the Christian world I found that one sometimes a little tricky for the the people who are really really faith based. And I'm right. not trying to be too critical, but just kind of well, the Lord will just cover me, and this is just going to happen sometimes. And and we do believe, obviously. Well, let's unpack that idea a little bit. If God pays for what He orders, but also how does that how does that connect with our responsibility of being positioned? We've talked about this, I know, in other places of, uh, you know, are we positioned to be blessed? Are we positioned to hear the Holy Spirit? Are we positioned to actually receive what he has for us? Or are we just 
you know, pursuing it, just thinking God's going to cover it when we haven't actually contributed what he's asked from us for. Yeah, that's called presumptuous sins. <laughs> and the psalmist is more than one saying, well, Lord, keep me from presumption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the difference between faith and presumption is the discernment of the Holy Spirit to tell you what's what. You know, because you can have something that feels like faith, but it's presumptuous. And yet on the other side, you can have like situations where God wants you to stretch out what you're willing to trust mm -hmm. him to believe. But again, now we get in faith, you know, I, I'm working on that this morning. Faith begins by giving by giving God something to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the primary, it's not the only way, but it's the primary way we measure the difference between presumption and faith is presumption wants a result that you've not you've not gradually built up to get it. You haven't you haven't invested enough of what you can do mm -hmm. to match what God wants to do in terms of of trust me, go for it. Go up. I, I want you to pursue this, but don't ask me to give all of it to you at once because it's the pursuit of, of faith that much helps mature you so that when you achieve what you are after, you're qualified to use it in a proper way. Right. And that's a huge idea. Yeah. And that the Lord will back it, I think, is part of with the idea of God pays for what he orders, yeah. that he will. We've, we've got to be positioned. We've got to be in what you're sharing there. And that in that, he will, he will provide if it's something that's supposed to happen. Right. And conversely... I think sometimes I've heard people blame the devil for things yeah, not happening. Exactly. That it was actually the Lord, the Lord wasn't behind it. It was yeah. something they wanted to have happen or yeah. they thought was going to happen. And and we can't always blame the enemy on that. Sometimes the well, Lord you, is, you know. You've heard me say this many times. I'm I I rejoice in the fact that we serve a God who hears and doesn't answer prayers. prayers. Yes. Because the prayers, if he answered them would destroy us. Right. Yeah, right. So. Sometimes we're not asking for the yeah. right thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, family came up a, a minute ago and we we're talking about that with, with wealth and everything. And I think that's a, a, a big topic, obviously today. Well, of course, family's been redefined uh, culturally, but from a biblical sense, you know, family is meant to be uh, in the family business. We're in yeah. the family business. And not that you have to literally be in the same business, but the idea of wealth transferring through the family unit and that is primarily, yeah. and the ideas of generational momentum, yeah. because that's all economics and management and culture. Um, and what, why is the family so important relative to that? Because it's the context God has taken for himself as uh, he said, you know, in the in gender creation, you're created in my image, not just that in a grow in a relatively larger sense, you know, he's he has a body, well he certainly has a body with Jesus. But uh, he is a father. Uh, the difference between a corporate relationship with a business easily begins to make people objects. A family, because of the re relational nature of what a real nuclear family is, is so, so built on the foundation of love. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why the family unit is the one that God historically uh, in business uh, you know, the more we can keep the relationships, the foundation of what we're doing, so that we are not using people. We're empowering people, helping to place people where God wants them with their skill sets and the gifts that he's given. That is done in a family contextually in a way that it's very hard to replicate uh, in, in large organizations. Right. So modeling, because the family is the basic building block of a healthy society, and that's because it's meant to produce healthy individuals. Yeah. And if we don't have that, then all else is 
going to fall because we don't, that's the foundation of any society. <laughs> and, um, and then the training I'm, I'm hearing from you too. Again, we talked about earlier, it's all one thing. The family structure is modeled in business and yep. the Trinity of course models government and business as well. It's separation of powers. You see these themes of how God structures things and realize if it's true in one area, it's true in another. Yep. And it's meant to empower. It's meant to separation of powers and all those different things. So I find when we start thinking this way, it's amazing. You kind of see it everywhere when you start thinking this way. Yep. And it's like you said, very empowering for just faith building, I think, too, for people that are in their families, but also in their business, that this is something, you know, work is a holy, everlasting calling. Yeah. And it's, it's... You noted the word everlasting, I trust. Yeah, right. Heaven exists. Good news, bad news. Good news, heaven is real. Bad news, it's not a retirement village. Right. <laughs> I think, I know we're kind of winding down our time here. But one I, uh, concept I think I'd like to maybe close with is one of the ideas... Uh, or things that have come up. We have a, a teaching on what is a Christian business. And I've seen this interesting with some of the other ministry groups and, and or some of the secular organizations that have wonderful, really biblical principles that mm -hmm. they're using in a secular context, right? Uh, but how do we differentiate between a Christian who is in business and a Christian who is actually fully operating as a Christian business person or operating a Christian business because it's not the same thing. I've, no, I sorry. know I have seen people, you know, that have kind of slapped Bible verses on their worldly practice right. to say then that it's a Christian business. Um, so, you know, what can we do to actually model? What does it really mean to embody a Christian business person and a Christian business? Great question. And I think, at this point in life, I think it's the commitment to empower people. That God demonstrated his commitment to empower people by dying on a cross. That was his eternal statement as to the price he was willing to pay to share his power. And I think a Christian business is driven by the same thing that drives God, is I want to use this the energy and the product and the profit. The, I want to use this uh, Petri dish, so to speak, where I'm injecting the empowerment of people that are the, getting the products, the services, both internally and externally. I'm bringing value, and the primary value is the support system that we have to those working with and receiving the product from what we're doing. That is a Christian business. Well, and let's, let's define empower because the world uses that term. And I think it means a very different thing than what we mean here Yeah. because the world, when they're talking about empowerment, which often I think goes hand in hand with their version of love yeah. is you are giving people what they want, what they have defined as their, reality mm -hmm. and that the only way to really love and empower them is to give them what they've decided is best for them uh barring it doesn't hurt anyone else of course yeah, but yeah. how you define that is always interesting but you know that that's that that's kind of their version and i would say the world's idea of empowerment also is very self-centered yes you know it's you're being empowered for you do you and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and all that stuff and it doesn't the world's definition does not include the idea of servant leadership, right? Yeah. And the fact that that we are so intertwined with one another that we can't, it can't just be about us, <laughs> you know, and 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 understanding what's actually really best for us, you know, what God God empowered us, but true empowerment is in the proper way and channels that He's designed us to live, not just what we think is best, right? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> No, 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 that's all true, and your point is very well taken. Um, the whole issue is where is self mm -hmm. in this discussion? Uh, I have a phrase that on the Master 12 Principles, I didn't get until two, maybe two years ago. The phrase is, love makes power safe. And when I saw that, I went, whoa. That's what, again, separates the difference between me and us. Uh -huh. 
And God is God doesn't live in a me world. He lives in an us world. And it's the usness, it's the embracing, and the climate, the melu, the the nature of of a relationship, where the issue is really how do I serve God by serving you? Right. That's empowerment. And what does it mean to really serve and love you? Because again, that's a term that's very misused yeah. in the culture today. It doesn't mean giving you what you want, as you pointed out a minute ago. It means giving to the best of our ability, giving you what God wants for you. Right. Being a, a traffic or being a mediator. Mediating right. grace. Mediating grace. Yeah. Helping empower people to be who God has made them to be, not necessarily who they think they're supposed to be yeah. or who the enemy is telling them to be, exactly. but who has God actually designed them to be? Because, you know, there's only, if you're anything other than who God has designed you to be, you're you're living a lie on a yeah. certain level, right? You're yes. not, and you're never going to ultimately be happy. Yeah. You're never going to ultimately be fulfilled because you know, it's it's like the analogy and as people do with with you know a boats, you know, a, a speedboat has a different nature and design than a rowboat. And yeah. if you're a rowboat constantly trying to be a speedboat, you're never gonna fulfill, you know, right. and vice versa, you're a speedboat trying to be a rowboat in that it's not gonna ever work. And and I yeah. think sometimes people think that that's some kind of cruelty because I can be whatever I want to be and I'm a speedboat. But if you're not, no, you can't. You can't. <laughs> And it's okay if you're not, because you're going to have so much more fulfillment right. being the rowboat that God made you to be, exactly. you know, and we need rowboats and yeah. we need speedboats. We need them both. Yeah. Right. But I think the world gives us this, you know, do anything kind of approach that is actually harmful for people. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, that I know again is, is addressed a bit in the with some of the concepts that we're talking about around who we're called to be. So any closing thoughts for us around just um, some of the big ideas we've talked about here, or, or even again, just maybe a summary of why, you know, it's important just to understand the, the environment of the business and the marketplace, the important role that, that people play every day at work. Yeah. Without being too personal, uh, I don't know what those of you who are watching all this, what you've got out of it all. But what I would hope you would get out of it is a significant piece is a dad talking with his daughter. Uh, a life, lives that have been fused together from the beginning. The rapport and the mutual love and respect for one another. Uh, that's really the, the most valuable thing out of all this is the spiritual environment uh, where we can be to each other uh, and encourage each other. And again, love makes power safe. Uh, and it's the only thing that brings real satisfaction. Love, the love of God, the agape of God, the love of God is fitting in to all that God has for you and for people. And that that is really the main event is you're trying to be supportive uh, of what God is doing in the lives of other people. So I would hope that you, you know, you get the feel of the nature of our relationship uh, and that the Lord would put it in your heart that that of all the stuff you want with your children or grandchildren, uh, it's to it's to be able to have a flow of love between. And I would hope that people see that and understand that really is where we're at. <laughs> you've you've done some great jokes about what it what it was like to be connected with me as a dad, yes. which are really funny. But uh, the beauty of all this is love. Love yeah. is the greatest thing. And I, and I would just say in, in closing addition to that, of the same thing really when we're in the, in the marketplace, because yeah. it's, it comes down to people, yeah. you know, loving people, loving God and loving people and really loving them is, is doing healthy business with them and empowering them and, and helping reflect Christ to them. And, yeah. uh, and one last thought on that, I would say too, and this will be a conversation for another time too, but that goes back to, to us personally, are we modeling 
Christ? Are yeah. we are we taking the time to understand the principles in the word that are going to allow us to have these kind of conversations? Yeah. You know, the, these things don't just come, you know, you don't drift into sanctification. You have to actively pursue the Lord, the word, a relationship, deal with conflict, all those things. But so for us to really be effective in the marketplace and in our relationships, we've got to be, you know, obviously continuing to run to the Lord and to, you know, having a mirror up to ourselves, right? And just so we end on a more business, directly business, you want to change your business, change yourself. <laughs> that was when we started the school almost more than anything else, you know, people got involved that, you know, they're going to teach me how to make money and I'll be prosperous and blah, blah. <laughs> and which is all great. Uh, if it's done God's way right. in the way that we're talking about it. But what I wanted every student to get from the beginning, if you really want to change your business, it's only going to be because you've changed you. Right. And what we're after in the schools and all these principles and all the rest of it is transformation and Christ likeness from you changing your business, which means you're changing everything that is radiating around that business as well. And may the Holy Spirit give you grace to do it with more and more power. Amen.